Good morning. This is my mother. She grew up in a broken home. By the time she was eight, her parents were divorced and living separately. As the older sister of two brothers, she grew up with a lot of premature responsibility, and she lacked a lot of life direction. This is my dad, but I've never called him that except jokingly. This is my poppy. He was born in the slums of Tijuana, Mexico. His journey to the United States as a toddler left him with memories of his mother being violently mugged, memories of his parents abandoning him as they crossed the border first, and an understanding of what it's like to come to a country with nothing and unwanted. We all have different starting points. How did we get from where we are now to where we want to be, from where we started to where we are now? Why are you sitting there? Why am I standing here? Why is my brother standing there? <laughs> it's because there is an idea that's many times overlooked, and it's how our thoughts affect our physical world. One of my personal favorites is an experiment by Japanese researcher and author Dr. Masura Edmodo, who demonstrates the effect that our thoughts have on the molecular structures of water. What he did was he took water droplets from many different environments. He had people pray on them. He had them in the presence of different words. He showed them pictures. And the results were truly astounding. This first image you see is the disarray of water frozen and under a microscope in the presence of the words, you make me sick. I will kill you. And then the incredible transformation of water in the simple words, thank you. This next one is the formless shape of water before prayer, and then the perfectly symmetrical and beautiful water crystal after prayer. This next one always amazes me. It's the awful and chaotic image that the name Adolf Hitler causes. And then again, the transformation of the words love and appreciation. Now think of what our thoughts and our words do to people around us and ourselves every day. We are all snowflakes. Think about how our thoughts and our feelings and our words affect our body, a body that is 60% water. It's no wonder there's so many physical ailments that are caused by depression. Think about how our thoughts, our feelings, and our words affect the people sitting next to you, affect your coworkers, affect your children. Now, why does this work? It's because our entire world, your hands, your chairs, your shoes, your breath, your thoughts, they're all made up of parts of atoms and subatomic particles, which as quantum physicists have discovered are made up of energy, spinning so quickly that they create this image of an atom that Newton gave us. And they work similar to the way sound waves and radio waves work. It's an intriguing idea to research. Dr. Bruce H. Lipton, in his book, The Biology of De Belief, describes an atom like a dust devil. The closer you get, the more you realize this entire structure is just tiny specks of dust moving so quickly. It's an amazing concept to grasp that our thoughts are really energy energy on a more familiar level that dictate how we feel and what we think is real, or in other words, our reality. Now, this is all common knowledge in the medical field and in the sciences, but it's not liberally applied to day-to-day -to -day life. The placebo experiment is used in drug trials daily, but it's not something that we think about normally. Now, this idea 10 doctors took to a new level, this power of belief. As you guys most likely know, our thoughts cannot reverse disease, but because they do affect the state that our body is in, as reflected by the water experiment, a more positive vibration, as I would call it, can help a cell grow healthy instead of as a disease cell. After all, our bodies are constantly changing parts, our stomach lining is replaced daily, our lungs every six weeks, our skin is constantly rejuvenating. This experiment took place at the Baylor School of Medicine, and it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2002. It consisted of 180 patients with knee arthritis. Now, the patients with the real surgeries, small incisions were made, a camera was inserted, and damaged tissue was repaired and removed. But on the placebo patients, the incisions were made, nothing was inserted, nothing was repaired, and nothing was removed. Over the course of the next two years, the study dictated that as the patients fill out five self-reported forms on pain functionality, and a climbing and stair climbing and walking test that the results showed that the people with the placebo surgery benefited the same as those with the real surgery. 
now how and why can this happen. It's because our mind doesn't know the difference, our body doesn't know the difference between what's real and what's not real. Their body reacted in the way that their mind anticipated because they believed they had had the actual surgery. Now, how does this all work? It all comes down to our reality and our perception. What we believe subconsciously to be real is what is real to us. Now, my reality, it changed when I was in sixth grade. With new experiences, a new environment, new people surrounding me, and thoughts to be the greatest musician and the greatest student the world had ever seen, I was in my element. This is where my life change took place. I had a group of best friends, a new experience for me, and I had a friend in almost everybody else. I did very well in school, and I loved school. I joined track, and I did fairly well. I was first in the flute section, third in the violin, joined Junior National Honor Society Student Council, and I got my first report cards of straight A's now that we had moved past the one through five numerical elementary school grading system. But I was a very different at person at home. I hated home, but I had no reason to. I hit what most people call the terrible teens, and I was terrible. I would yell and I would snap at my little brother who tried to tell me jokes and what was interesting in his elementary school world. My sister and I went from being best friends to enemies. I didn't let her touch me. I wouldn't hug her anymore. I was mean. I said things that hurt on purpose. I had a sort of pride in how eloquently I could cut with my words, and I was good at it. That's one of the things I regret the most, how distant I became from my sister, and how my brother and I never really had that chance to connect. She was my mouthpiece and protector until I was almost seven, because until then, I didn't have the courage to talk for myself. I would stand behind her and follow her everywhere, and she would go do it for me. She left for boot camp on the 28th, but that year I broke that bond that I've never really gotten back, and it was all my fault. I resented my parents for not parenting the way others did. I was angry at them all the time, and as I grew so involved in my little sixth grade bubble, I changed so much from the person I had been and the person I wanted to be. I realized that year, well, I realize now about that year, that you can't pretend to be a good person half the time while hurting those that matter, or even thinking there are people in the world who don't matter. I had a teacher tell me recently never to lose that compassion for life, for other people, because that's what gives everything value. Now, the life and the experience of a little sixth grade girl may seem petty or insignificant, but everybody's mind change takes place somewhere. And it's always so real, and it always matters. That's where my mind change took place. That summer was the worst. My parents decided I needed a change of scenes for obvious reasons, so they moved me off to charter school, and they moved me into the same room with my sister and even into the same bed. I was doing great in school, and I felt as if I was being unfairly punished. I made myself sick that summer. I cried once or twice a day. I had a cough for three months, and I lost 15 pounds. I'm sure partial instability of my emotions was due to my age, but a lot of it was due to how I was functioning mentally. All through that, by the time I was in eighth grade, I had this huge appreciation for what my parents had done, even as much as I hated moving to charter school. Their parenting is still one of the things that I admire the most. You see, my mind changed that year, and I became part of a family. I realized they weren't disrespecting me. I was the one that was disrespecting. So I ask myself, why does this mind change take place? It all goes back to our realities and our perceptions. We think in pictures. I say, Tahoe, you see some pristine lake. I say, pirate, I know I see Johnny Depp. <laughs> now, all of these things come to show us that there's nothing as important as this image we hold in our mind. We have this amazing ability to control what pictures are in our head, and the act of creating something real in our head and emotionally connecting to it is what creates the possibility and the reality of that picture coming true. It's the reason why there are successful cocaine dealers as well as successful doctors, because we have the ability to decide not only what our goal is, but how successful that goal is by what we think about. Nobody accomplishes anything great on accident. We think of Alexander Fleming, the man who invented penicillin, as someone who happened to success, when in reality his entire life had been dedicated to finding cures. He knew exactly what he wanted. 
Our reality is what we see in our mind. Now, why did I change? It's because I changed what I was picturing. I no longer saw my parents crying over my dead body anymore and regret over how awful they were to me. I no longer saw myself in a different home with a different mother, father, sister, brother. I gained so much experience by moving to charter school, and I was proud of that new perspective. I saw people who didn't have a home, who didn't have mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, who had been raped. I saw people and met people who didn't know what ambition was, who didn't find any value in respect, and I realized how much I had. I changed my picture that year. I changed my picture in visions to myself, making people smile, making people laugh and a suit the owner of a business, speaking to crowds and their visions that I've kept with me. Walking down the hallways at Carson High was such a gift to me because I never thought I would have that opportunity and I desperately wanted it. But the talk seemed so small. I was proud of the fact that I cared more than who was doing what this weekend or when I would have my first boyfriend or my first kiss. The secret to life, in my opinion, is finding a goal that's worth living and then realizing that every moment, every thought, every picture you form is bringing you either one step closer to that goal or one step farther to that, from that goal. And that thought has to be a picture. It has to be a feeling. It has to be something real in your mind, and it takes work. But it's worth it if your goal's worth it. Serena Williams' dad wrote a detailed book of what his daughter's life would look like when they were born and it's the life that they're living of champions because it's the only reality that they've ever known. My brother talked and pictured having goats long before my parents considered buying any, and I've seen myself standing in front of a crowd hundreds of times in my mind. I felt this feeling. There's nothing so important as that image. This is the real world that I see. It's the reality that I hope you see. It's where what we think matters. It's where we picture ourselves affects where we end up. How we feel affects how we live our life. It's a powerful realization. Use it to change your lives. Use it to help others change theirs. Thank you. Woo!